Hello everyone and welcome to the benefits of Dark Skies to Long Island program. Please leave any questions in the chat box. The speaker will answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. If you would like to be part of the Hamptons um, Observatory email list, please visit the link that I sent in the chat. You can email them or you can leave your email address in the chat box as well and then we can forward that over to them. Our speaker today is Susan Harder, the New York State Representative of the International Dark Sky Association, and she has been working on this issue for over 25 years. Ms. Harder is also on the board of the Hamptons Observatory. So we'll start. Um, I, I'm happy to see you all tonight, although I can't see your faces. I'm glad you're here. Um, this is an issue, light pollution, that this presentation is going to seem uh, intuitive. Uh, I'm here simply to draw lines between the dots. It has been said about lighting that never have so many known so little about so much. So my job is just to introduce you to what is light pollution and what we can do about it as individuals and collectively. So the title is The Economic and Environmental Impact along with the solutions to ineffective outdoor lighting. Okay, I'm gonna to try to move forward. There we go. So uh, like she said, I've been doing this for about 25 years and I have been uh, appointed the New York State representative. So I get fielded questions from all over New York State uh, to work on this issue. And I started with um, the Hamptons Observatory. Originally it was the Montauk Observatory and we had to change the name because we have programs all over um, the South Fork. I did take lighting design because I needed to know how to do what I was suggesting people do. I'm on the Residential Roadway Lighting Committee, and I have taken the, the uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Training Workshop. I've helped enact lighting laws in many New York communities and in New York City and Suffolk County and various towns and villages. So why did I get involved in this, prog this program in the first place? Well, my neighbor's lights, which are there illustrated, were shining into my bedroom. And I went to my town code and it said the light source shall not be visible across property lines. Seemed pretty clear to me. But what it lacked was clear definition, so it was never enforced. But this is a very common problem with lighting laws. The intent is there, but the execution requires, you know, professional recommendations. We only use the term light pollution for misdirected, unshielded, excessive, and unnecessary night lighting. Not all night lighting. It's called dark sky, not dark ground. And you can see it. It's glare, sky glow, and it's air pollution. This is a, the illustration of the main problem. We end up with light pollution going up, we end light trespass going across, and what we want to do is focus on useful light. This is what it looks like in real life. This is in East Hampton. And this is what we try to help regulate. Sky glow is a result of light that's either reflected or it's going directly up into the sky and hitting particulate and moisture. This is what the comet would have looked like in the city versus out here in the country. This is with and without the blackout. So only, well, actually less than a third of the people in our country can even see the Milky Way. All across the world are uh, organizations aff affiliated with the International Dark Sky Association. This will show you the problem that we're facing. This is light that's coming up. And here's Long Island. As you can see, the light is getting ever increasing coming out towards the east end. This, unfortunately, is the satellites are also lighting up the night sky. But the International Dark Sky Association right now, we are focusing on ground oriented lighting. And this is an organization that was started 35 years ago in Tucson because they're surrounded by observatories. The astronomers went to the city fathers and they helped enact the first dark sky law. 
So we work on educating, it's a nonprofit. We work on educating the public and our officials about best practices. There are consequences. We get the sky glow, but also we have glare, which is when you have a bright light source interfering with night vision. Light trespass is causing issues between properties. Wasted electrical energy, it's estimated that it's at least a third of our electrical energy at night is wasted as light pollution. There are dramatic ecological disturbances. Human health is severely affected by night lighting. And we lose that connection that we can't quite quantify about seeing the stars in the night sky. So what we do is we advocate for dark sky lighting. And this is by using shielded fixtures, meeting but not exceeding professional light levels for safety, using it when you need it. And the correct height is important because you want to have it in relation to the property line to prevent the light trespass. We're also advocating for reducing the blue light that's in light sources. And there's going to be plenty of light for safety, reduce glare, you see better, conserving energy, very important, protecting our health, and enhancing the nocturnal environment, not just for the creatures, great and small, but also to enjoy it. And we can also see the stars. I advocate for retrofits because they pay for themselves. And these facts and figures are just, you know, beyond comprehension. You know, billions of dollars, tons of coal, oil, because most electricity is still generated through burning coal and oil. Of course, this is going to cause air pollution and increasing our taxes and product prices. So a quarter ton of coal, if you leave a 100 watt light bulb on every night, it burns a quarter ton of coal. And of course, we've got this air pollution, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, etc. The main concerns for lighting design would be glare, because glare is a hazard for drivers, pedestrians, light trespass. It reduces our privacy and interferes with sleep. That's what happened to me. And up lighting is going to directly affect our night sky. And overlighting is completely unnecessary, wasting money, wasting energy. Glare is an issue, as you can see here, because over on the left hand side, that's a railroad sign. And this is a um, building in uh, East Hampton. And the, the issue with night vision being impeded by glare is because during the daytime, when you have headlights coming towards you, they're not as obtrusive. But at night, you've got the contrast of dark against the lighter bright source. So it affects you more. And we can't see both at the same time. We can't see it. You know how when you come out of a movie theater and you have to readjust your eyes? Well, the same thing happens at night. And it takes longer as we get older because our eyes are less elastic. This is what a, cand a candlelight could be seen for miles against black. But in a lit room, it's going to bounce around and it becomes more uniform. We don't have uniformity uh, out outside. And the human eye is always going to adjust to that brightest light source. Oh, this is actually an old fashioned LIPA utility pole floodlight. And we worked with uh, LIPA and they introduced this fully shielded version. This is what the light now looks like. It goes all down, no glare. And they changed all the fixtures on their own facilities with the help of Richie Kessel when he was at LIPA. Now, distracting glare is, is, is a big issue because your eye will autonomically go towards a brighter light source. It just does that all on its own. And if it's off to the side, your car's going to go 300 feet and you're not going to be looking straight ahead. And of course, you know, we're on an island surrounded by water. And when there's glare offshore, it can cause accidents because you can't see as well. And you plus you can't see the navigational aids. Light trespass is a big problem. The building on the upper left is a senior housing. And down on the right is a house of a friend of mine. And it's completely lit up by the unshielded fixtures on the side of that building. This is light trespass on a house in um, 
Southampton from this house. See, it's completely lit up. This is an illustration of me in my bed with my neighbor's lights coming in. This is from a brochure that we put together for East Hampton. Something we have to re we have to really pay attention to the fact that we've all every creature has evolved in a not dark night and light day. Electric lighting is virtually a new phenomenon. And our bodies go through a whole series of um, of, of, of uh, hormonal changes during the night, which if when we're lit, we don't go through our true circadian rhythms. So it's so just one pulse of artificial light at night disrupts your circadian cell divisions and the damage to cell division is characteristic of cancer and is therefore important. So it's very important to sleep in the pitch dark. And the ways that it interferes is not just circadian rhythms, but of course we're gonna have more air and water pollution. The melatonin is, all, is produced by our bodies in the dark. And when there's light in, in our bedrooms, we lose that um, ability to produce the melatonin. Melatonin is a tumor suppressant. Our sleep is disturbed, childhood leukemia, et cetera. So, we do have, we, the American Medical Association has classified light at night, LAN, as a carcinogen. And it's a major driver of breast cancer and also prostate cancer. This is all about the melatonin suppression, suppression of the immune system. It's just very important. But also not just humans, but flora and fauna are also affected because most creatures, the majority of creatures are nocturnal and their habitats are disturbed. Every creature that's been studied. The first conference was held in 2002. There's a natural bias to scientists and researchers studying daytime phenomenon because it's more difficult to study at night, you can't see. So this was the first one and every single, this was their poster, and every single, um, every single creature that they studied was affected by night lighting. Night lighting results in ecological disturbances and mortality of individuals and entire species in ways that are being discovered in every study. I'm not going to go through every one. I'll just say bats, sea turtles, frogs, salamanders, snakes, moths, fish, songbirds, especially been well documented. Zooplankton, they don't come up at night to consume algae when the water's lit. Trees die back when they don't go into dormancy and puffins and petrels. And so all of the things we do for nature preservation are absolutely necessary, but they might not be sufficient if we don't address light at night. So another study came out saying that fireflies can't find each other to mate when, they're in, when there's a lot of ambient light because that's how they communicate. This is a diagram that shows you what the sea turtles have done. When there's light off to the left, the sea turtles, when they hatch in the sand, they'll go towards the light and get run over. When it's dark, they'll go towards the ocean. And there's a law in Florida, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife enforce it, so that the lighting along the beaches has to be very highly controlled. It has to be amber in color and shielded. This is a poster for National Bird Migration Day, which was recently, was last week. But see, they fly at night. Birds migrate at night to save energy because it's cooler. And you can see that there's renderings of stars. Unfortunately, birds are thrown off course because they partially navigate by the stars and they also crash into lit buildings. They also circle endlessly lit communication towers to exhaustion. Uh, here's a couple of examples of lit buildings. In Toronto, they have a program, FLAP, and they collect all the dead birds at the bottom of all these buildings. So that they ended up convincing 
uh, the cities to shut off unnecessary night lighting. We just had two laws passed in New York City so that the unnecessary city lights owned by the city will be shut off during migration. These are the bills, 274. It passed unanimously with the help of Audubon. Trees are lit at night, unfortunately, all night long. And this one here is holding on to its leaves when it's supposed to be going into dormancy, which is going to cause it to die back. This is a better rendering. Please let's remember, you know, this electric light, which we take for granted, it's been in our lives, our whole lives, um, is a recent phenomenon, which we need. It's, a, it's an important aspect of our lives. But we have to remember that light bulbs are false light. In the middle top, we have the full spectrum. You know, when you were in, high, in elementary school, you would have the prism and it would divide up sunlight equally in all colors. Well, light bulbs don't have all the colors. They just have different proportions of colors. And also, brightness has constantly increased per watt. Watts go in, lumens go out. So candles were 200, and now we're up to 24,000 lumens coming from these recent uh, uh, light bulbs. So what's a lumen? Lumens are on the packages. We can't buy light bulbs anymore just based on watts because the few, we have fewer and fewer watts with more and more lumens coming out. This shows you the contrast. So an 8-watt LED is going to be equivalent of a 100-watt incandescent, our traditional bulbs. It's also important to pay attention to the color because blue light is very problematic. I'm going to give you some examples. LEDs have very start out as blue, and they only get warmer by adding filters. And I went to a blue light symposium, which just shocked me. This was back in 2015. Since then, we've had a lot more information coming out and a lot more means to pull the blue out of LEDs through, they have blue light blocking glasses. On your iPhones, you can do those night filters where it blocks out the blue. You can have a uh, stick on to your screen so you can uh, block out the blue. Blue, you know how difficult it is to see after you pass those blue headlights? Well, it's because your eyes will shut down tighter in the presence of blue light. So you're not seeing as well. Also, they, to readapt after you pass the headlights, it takes longer for your eyes to open up again. So it interferes blue light which is referred to as the higher Kelvin, which is yet something else you have to look at for the packaging. It interferes with night vision. It disrupts your circadian rhythms. The redder the light, the less disruptive. So if you have a red night light in your bedroom, it doesn't shut off your melatonin. Um, you're gonna, it, there's just real problems with, um, with blue light. Also, they're, it, they're suspecting that it's causing the macular degeneration. You know, which is why we wear the UV sunglasses during the day, because the daytime, there's a lot of blue light. So the higher the Kelvin, the more sky glow, because blue light are, is basically very short wa uh, uh, waves. That's why we have blue sky during the daytime. The, the sky during the daytime is black, but it's blue because they scatter more. blue, blue. So we want to get the lower Kelvin. And we're recommending the International Dark Sky Association, the board of directors came out and had issued a maximum of 2200 Kelvin for outdoor night lighting, which has also been passed unanimously in the Suffolk County Legislature for their own county fixtures. This is the bill. It was 1805, sponsored by legislator uh, Bridget Fleming. I'd like to advocate for changing. And changing can be difficult, but it's usually cost effective when you've got an unshielded, excessive, or, you know, unnecessary light. By making simple changes, the bulb, the fixtures, the location, adding timers and sensors, you're going to end up saving money, and it pays for itself. So a lot of our street lights are 150-watt high-pressure sodium. And if we switch them to the LEDs, we can save 
quite a bit of money, but it's very important to also evaluate the usefulness. There's a lot of street lights that just went in as sort of a knee jerk reaction. You know, we need a street light here, but you know, we need to follow the professional recommendations of when to use a street light because it's a very expensive proposition. We also want to use 1800 Kelvin for LED street lights because they're exactly the same color of the high pressure sodium, which has been used for decades. What we're asking is for people to change. So to the fearful, it is threatening because it means that things may get worse. To the hopeful, it's encouraging because things may get better. To the confident, it is inspiring because the challenge exists to make things better. So here we go, the one for one replacement, bulb replacement to a lower output, bulb type to reduce the impact, re-aiming, switching, adding a shield, adding a motion sensor, and removing redundant. You'd be surprised there's quite a bit of redundant lighting. Now here's a wonderful retrofit example. This is an after. This is 3,500 watts of shielded gas station lighting. This is what it was before, 6,400 watts. So which one would you feel more comfortable pulling into? With the glare? You know, glare makes people feel unsafe. Or this one, perfectly lit, all the light levels are met. I thought I'd just show you some residential solutions. I have these. You can turn them off if you want to, and they can also be set for motion. So they got, we have options now. We didn't, 10 years ago, we couldn't find these easy uh, um, options. Bug lights are perfect for your doorway. Won't gather bugs, you can see better, and you save energy. Lots of us have neighbors that have lighting that's coming into our house or left on all the time. Um, you can invite them over, have them take a look back at their house. They didn't install that light. It was installed by an electrician. Electricians do not have lighting training. They have electrical training. Architects have building training. They don't have lighting training. Engineers have engineering training. They don't have lighting training. It's a lighting designer or ourselves who have to point out these issues. And this is a, I have one of these. This is my red light that guides my way to go to the bathroom at night, plugs into the wall. Um, sometimes you can just buy this tape, which I got at the auto repair shop and put it over the lens of a fixture. And the iPhones obviously have a, a so this is something I had, I invented myself. Um, I don't sell these. These are sold by an astronomer friend of mine but I invented these little shields that you snap onto the bulbs. The best thing we can do is to set timers as well as shutting lights off ourselves. But when you're away, if you leave all your lights on outside your health, it doesn't provide security. Security is, is, ba is based on if someone thinks you're there. So you have two interior lights on independent timers. The International Dark Sky Association has a wonderful page here for every kind of application of what they call their International Dark Sky Approved, Dark Sky Friendly Fixtures. And you can go there and you can find, you know, fixtures for all sorts of things. And um, on one side are all the unshielded fixtures, on the right hand side are the alternatives. And the way that these shielded fixtures work is they have all these little reflective shields up and up and uh, up on top and it directs the light around proportionately these are the um these are the types of fixtures which and marketing is is going forward with these companies you know the manufacturers are, are fortunately getting on board now they still have the unshielded fixtures but they've started to add the so-called dark sky friendly fixtures this is one of their brochures from RAB. They still produce those unshielded wall packs, but now they have shielded versions. Here's another manufacturer, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, How We Wonder Where You Are, Spring City. They produce um, all types, the good and, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. In New York City, in New York State, years ago, 
we passed the Healthy, Safe, and Energy Efficient Outdoor Lighting Act. Now, this only applies to state-owned lighting. And we now have another bill coming forward from uh, a, a, a state senator that will try to address more of the issues of, about light pollution. So <laughs> these are the old street lights on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side is the fully, what we call fully shielded, which means that the bulb is completely surrounded by an opaque shield and all the light is directed downward. So our highways are gradually changing over from the unshielded to the shielded type. These are the, this is another example here. And this is from Calgary. In the front, in the foreground, you can see the shielded fixtures that were put in. In the background, they're still working on the unshielded. In East Hampton, um, we had these unshielded type fixtures where the bulb was right in the middle of a, of a clear globe, and it was pretty dangerous. 30% of the light was going up. In fact, you could, one of the, one of the ladies who was um, in charge of the village at that time said that when she was flying back from France, she could see all the lights in East Hampton Village. So we worked with the manufacturer and they developed the same type of looking, semi-historic looking picture, uh, uh, fi fixture, and the bulb was put up inside the, the opaque cap. And then it's, seen you know, we've reduced the sky glow. And here above is unshielded and down below, you can see all the light is better distributed on the sidewalk where you need it. And the village, uh, Ladies Village Improvement Society paid for that. I put this in here so you could see that there's the color temperature of um, the Kelvin that I referred to. So daylight is going to have a lot of blue in it. So that will be around 6,500. So we go more for the 2200, the 2700, which would be the so-called warm white. The problem that we've got with some of our residential fixtures is that these are the so-called old fashioned. They would have had candles in them, which would have been, you know, the equivalent of about 15 watts incandescent. But we need to have shielded fixtures. We can't just buy fixtures based on what they look like during the day. We need to see what they look like at night. That happens a lot with these post tops that are, you know, semi-historic. Here's another one. This is when the manufacturer designs the lighting. Instead of a lighting designer, you get a lot of fixtures. And here's a contrast. This is an interesting contrast. On the left was the Sag Harbor fixture. And on the right-hand side, this is Port Jefferson, shielded, unshielded. Here's some more shielded, historic looking fixtures. There's quite a few. These are in the 1800 Kelvin as well. So when I was in Rome on the Via Appia, they have sh fully shielded streetlights. They also have them in front of Buckingham Palace. Uh, here's some residential fully shielded. Here's some residential landscape fully shielded. Here's a contrast with the old wall packs, which they still sell. Um, for billboards, we try to advocate for being mounted on the top, aim down. Here's a mounted on the top. You can read the sign. This was the before, was mounted on the, on the ground facing up. This is a pitiful example of a bad flag light. Um, but we do have flag lights that are mounted on top and there you can use a lot less power and lights up the flag fine it twirls around as the wind moves also for tower lights these are on windmills they have a system that is triggered by the transponders in airplanes airplanes have transponders so they would only be illuminated when a, an airplane was in the vicinity there is good sports lighting, which will light up the field without lighting up, you know, the neighborhood in the night sky. So just to review the causes of light pollution. So it will always be the unshielded and excessive light fixtures that emit light upward and off the target. 
light levels exceeding the recommendations. And the recommendations are very straightforward and they're measured in foot candles. I'll show you a diagram. Unnecessary redundant lighting, misaimed, fixtures that are incorrectly located, no sensor, no dimming, or no shutoffs, and light sources that are too high in the blue light waves. The Illuminating Engineer Society and the International Dark Sky Association, which at times have been at odds with each other, came up with very clear mutual recommendations. Make sure that there are five principles for responsible outdoor lighting, that it's useful, it's targeted, the light levels are low enough, but adequate to see, controlled, and that the color is adjusted. We use these uh, professional recommendations. The International Dark Sky Association has an outdoor lighting handbook. The Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, it's a green building council. They have a light pollution credit. Uh, the Illuminating Engineer Society has recommended practices for all sorts of applications. And there's plenty of um, communities that have enacted dark sky laws. The legislation that is useful is obviously our, but our local zoning codes and review boards are our first avenues. But New York State has a Dark Skies Protection Act that's coming forward. Suffolk County passed a law in New York City. The Illuminating Engineer Society put out a brochure that tells people exactly how many foot candles for every application. So not to look at all of this, but walkways, bikeways, now, foot candles are the measurement of light that is one foot away from a candle. Moonlight is 0 .01 foot candle. Walkways, parking lots, etc., the average is 0.2. So you don't need a whole lot of light to see well. And this has all been recommended by manufacturers as well. This is what a lighting plan would look like that gets submitted to your planning department. Uh, this is a lighting plan that I helped put together for the spring school around the corner from me so that we would know exactly where the light would go and in what proportions. On the right hand side is a light meter and on the left is for sound. Lots of myths about lighting. Everybody thinks, oh, more light's got to be better, but it's like salt. You know, just enough. Too much salt is not a good thing, and too much light is not a good thing. And the main myth is that lighting provides security. And this is a, this is a, a, I think it's mostly comes from a fear of the dark. The Department of Justice evaluated the relationship between lighting, and they said there's the indication is that increased lighting only decreases the fear of crime. If any decision is taken to increase lighting, it needs to be taken on the best possible evidence because it does have substantial environmental consequences. So you just need real, you need security and not bad lighting. So like I said, having two independently timed interior lights will give the illusion that you're home because criminals most crime is committed during the day, for one thing. Also, you know, if, if there's somebody walking around your property with a flashlight, maybe your neighbor or passing car might report it. They did question criminals who'd been, who had committed property crimes. And they listed their deterrence. Dog would be number one. Alarm systems, number two. Somebody's at home or the appearance of being at home, but they didn't even mention security lighting. We do have uh, infrared cameras that can provide light, provide, you know, they can tape, um, cam the camera can work properly in low light. And dark, there's a dark campus policy where they've saved a lot of money, not just on the energy, but decreased vandalism, loitering and break-ins. They, they, they reduced $160,000 in vandalism damage to 41,000. We, and the director of security said, we saved so much on utilities that our business managers and everybody else was quite impressed. 
prisons can have good lighting because you know they're not flying up above the prison these are all shielded atm lighting is notoriously bad and it doesn't need to be they use the excuse of new york state ATM law, but that law does not say that they have to use unshielded fixtures. They can have shielded fixtures and provide adequate lighting and meet the uh, ATM law. And people may not know this, but I can actually, this is a view from my apartment. They turn off these necklace lights in Manhattan in the middle of the night. You know, they're not necessary. So there's lots of uh, means of, of changing things. And here's a, the so-called barn blaster. We have a lot of these. If you change the bulb, it'll direct all the light down. You don't have to change the fixture. Solutions are simple. Education goes a long way with this issue. Showing people examples really does help. Setting policies, guidelines, and regulations and enforcement have to be done through your local uh, legislators. The Long Island Power Authority, years and years and years ago, sent the, this was included in our bills. They talked about the protecting the starry night sky. Southampton has a, a law and they distribute this quick guide to tell people what the law entails. East Hampton sent out this brochure, talked about how to protect our night sky and our environment, quality of life, with this nice illustration of a little owl, I can see in the dark, thank you. And Davis Sobel, who's my neighbor and the author of Galileo's Daughter, wrote the blight of urban sky glow stops children from wishing on stars lovers from counting them light pollution severs our human connection to the beautiful celestial creatures of the night and here's a new book i just found i just stuck this in this afternoon and i'm dying to read this so this should this should come out this should be a good book for kids in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So I'm hoping that you all will join the Hamptons Observatory because we have wonderful lectures about beauty and the importance of the night sky. This is what this is our goal, a world with a beautiful, thick, starry night sky. That's the end of my little talk. And these are the websites that you can visit for a little more information. And that's my email. You can send me an email if you have a question. And I will answer questions now. All right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> that was definitely very informative. So what, what questions can I 